Okay, we're at NIFSI, middle of winter, and we're gonna go talk to some folks at the National Incident Radio Support Cache. This is where they manage the inventory of radios that go out on incidents nationwide. So we're just gonna get an overview of how these guys do their jobs and what's in the building and how they fix the radio, service them, all that good stuff. So let's take a look. To me, when I walk in here, this is pretty impressive. I mean, I was describing to you, this kind of looks like the Home Depot of radio caches. Well, in, and in actuality, that's kind of what it is because we have in excess of 8,000 handheld radios, about 150 VHF repeaters, about 100 UHF repeaters, aircraft link kits, mm -hmm. remote kits. We've got a lot of radios. These radios are primarily sent to the larger fires. Absolutely. And the districts, you know, obviously have their, their inventory of radios. The firefighter, on the ground, when they get a radio from the cache, it's going to be a radio that they are expecting. It's a radio that they already know how to use. I think about, uh, you know, the batteries that these things go through, and I'm trying to remember what my expectations were for batteries. I guess I usually just would just run them until I started getting the blinking light, and then I'd pull my cassette of little taped together batteries and slam, slam them, in, them there. in there. Yes. And I remember thinking that I had, to, I. I was packing a lot of batteries. So do you think the batteries are getting better? The batteries are definitely getting better. The battery chemistry is getting better and everything like that. But as we add more bells and whistles to our radios, they suck more juice. One thing I can tell you about AA batteries is heavy day, heavy fire season, middle of the summer, we go through in excess of 350,000 AA batteries a day. 350,000 AA batteries a day. That's nationally, not, not just here out of the cache. That's all of the fires, all of the incidents everywhere in the country. 350,000 AA batteries a day. That's a lot of AA batteries. Wow. Okay, I copy. So what we have here is kind of our museum because like we were talking about earlier, you can't figure out where you're gonna go until you know where you came from. I can remember working for a crew for DNR back in the day, if we had two radios like this on a crew, we were happy. And let me tell you, those were a bear to lug around. It's got four channels on it, the MX-330. This was a two-channel radio. But I'll tell you what, this was a heck of a lot easier to pack than that pack set. Just before we went to the King radios, we had the MX360. Now you've got eight channels. And these are a synthesized radio, so they can be programmed, but not programmed in the field. So when we finally went to the King radio, which is a field programmable radio, that changed the whole ballgame. When the equipment is coming back from a fire, the first place that it's going to stop is rework, which is the area that we're in right now, and that's where the folks would go through, clean the kit up, get all the junk and debris out of it. Uh, if there's anything lost, stolen, or damaged, replace that, make note of it, and then they'll send it up to the technicians mm -hmm. for them to test it. And so here's where the technicians are actually working on the radio. Aircraft link kits mm -hmm. that he's working on right here. And generally, this is the unit that's going to be used to talk from the helibase to the helicopter. So what we have here is the command repeater. Uh -huh. This is what, when they're out on the fire, division soups, whatnot, are talking back to the ICP. If we need to use the repeater for extended coverage over the fire, this is what we're now, now utilizing. They're gonna go through, test them, make sure everything passes the tests and then it's going to go out and be voice checked. Once it's voice checked, then it'll come back in, actually goes back to the rework area. They're going to now repack the kits, put a ready for issue sticker on it, and it's ready to go back out the door. We're gonna to talk to Gary Stewart. He's the uh, communications duty officer coordinator. He manages all the frequencies nationwide for any incidents we go on. But this is, I guess you could call it their command center for frequency management. And this is Gary, and he's sitting at his station um, with the display right here. The one that really stands out to me is this display that represents each incident that was happening. What was the date? August 1st, uh, the 15th. 
August 1st through the 15th of last fire season, this represents all the different incidents that needed different frequencies. And as Gary will explain, this is a pretty complex process. By the time he gets all these frequencies distributed legally and fairly and all that kind of stuff. So the position uh, that we do as the communications duty officer coordinator, I am the one that finds all of the temporary frequencies for all wildfires nationwide or all risk incidents. It's an extremely large part of wildland fire. We have to ensure that there is legal authorized frequency use with zero chance of interference. DOI USDA only has 194 frequencies. We reuse those. Frequencies are a limited resource. There's only so many. When we get into a situation like this, we will call in what we call our communications coordinators. Mm -hmm. They're an extension of our office and they will go out and set in the geographical area coordination center and work just in that GAC. So I'm feeding them information. They're contacting the communications unit leaders and working closer with the GAC and the communications unit leaders on the fires where I am mainly working with the Washington office, making sure that we have the equipment available uh, as the requests come in so that we can fill them and get them out of here on a, on a quicker basis. Here at the fire center, we have to strive for reliability because what we're putting up is a portable communication system. It's not permanent infrastructure, so we can't put in a lot of those bells and whistles that may be available with a permanent infrastructure type system. If we had a digital radio system in place, which we will at some point in time, once we get to digital we would be able to, for example, cut down on some of our radio traffic by being able to have a pre-scripted message in your phone where send a burst transmission to supply and they've got the order. I now don't have to send that message in with breaks and everything else tying up the radio system. You know, one of the big issues with cell phones and mobile devices, they work great in a, an urban area. They work great where you've got cell phone coverage. Even when we get out on incidents, people want us to bring in cows and colts, cells on wheels, cells on light trucks to give them more coverage. But for the person who's actually out on the fire line, the coverage is, at this point in time, not available. Now, maybe if it's something that's provided by satellite or something like that, yes, we, we would then be able to give everybody all the apps they want. We would also be able to do tracking and things like this. The whole idea of unmanned aerial vehicles mm -hmm. and what are those going to do for us in communications and, and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. We have actually utilized civil air patrol planes to fly over a fire with a repeater in them and provide the communications for a fire. If at some point in time we would have a UAV that was able to carry a repeater for a payload, that can sit up there and loiter for a heck of a lot longer than a Civil Air Patrol plane can. Then it's just a matter of how long the battery is gonna last. You know, maybe we'll throw solar technology onto that UAV to keep those batteries charged indefinitely. So I'm guessing you're probably recommending that everybody go through the process of programming, accessing channels, setting up priorities, all that kind of stuff before fire season, right? Yeah, if, if you're coming to fire season and you haven't, say, played with your radio recently, it's a good idea to just get refreshed. Hey, remember, know your radio before you go out there. Mm -hmm. Trying to learn a radio on an incident just screams, watch out. You look at all these fatality fires or fires where things went bad and there's right. always an issue with communication. Something has been balled up with communication. Yes. If you don't have communications established, you can't go out there and safely try to attack this fire. Right. Bottom line. My impression is when we have problems with communication, it's not necessarily the radio. Exactly. It's how we manage the frequencies on the radios and all that kind of stuff. Well, and, and sometimes it may be a communications issue, but the communications issue is that people didn't sit down and talk about exactly what they're going to do. How are we going to accomplish this? Radio systems are intended to be reliable and predictable, but when the conditions are constantly changing, there will be surprises. When they happen, 
What's your default? Do you have a fallback, a plan of action that everyone on your crew knows? Take a close look at radio operations on your crew. Consider standard operating procedures that can help sort things out when it gets confusing.